Hey everyone, thank you for coming back to your small faith group. Um, this week, as we continue looking at the liturgy or looking at our Mass, we're going to focus on the Eucharistic prayer. Um, there are so many parts to the Eucharistic prayer. I'm counting at least eight or nine. There's Thanksgiving, Acclamation, the Epiclesis, the Institution Narrative and Consecration, the Amnesis, the Offering, the Intercessions, the Final Doxology. That it would be really easy to get lost in some of the details and some of the really interesting sorts of things that happen, like why does the priest wash his hands, or why is there incense sometimes, or incense and not at other times. But rather than get caught up in, in all those sort of details, what I want to take today and on this video do for you is sort of give you maybe a general framework for understanding the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, the Eucharistic prayer really is sort of, sort of the highlight, the, the, the climax of what happens on Sunday. And so sort of maybe sort of a general overarching view of it, how it works and what we're doing might help you appreciate it more and enter into it more. It's unfortunate, and I suffer from this myself, that it's repeated so often that we, we use a Eucharistic prayer at every single Mass, we hear similar words at every single Mass, that sometimes those words become dull to us or commonplace to us, when actually the repetition of them should help us enter more deeply into the mystery of what we're celebrating. Because really what we're celebrating is the salvation that comes to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. As you know, the Eucharist, the Eucharistic prayer, means thanksgiving. So the Eucharistic prayer is our great prayer of thanksgiving. So hopefully whenever you come to the liturgy, you have something in mind from the last week or something in your life for which you can be thankful. But don't worry. If you have nothing particular in mind, you may have noticed that every time we begin the Eucharistic prayer, I will give you something. There's always a reason to be thankful, and I will provide you with that reason. It begins with the preface of the Eucharistic prayer, which is really the Eucharistic prayer in earnest. Um, I brought over with me the Roman Missal. This is the book that we use whenever we celebrate Mass, and I will just randomly here pick for you one of the, one of the prefaces, prefaces that we use. Um, you know the dialogue. It begins with, The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. Of course, it's a call to give thanks. It's Eucharist. It's the thanksgiving prayer. But then what follows that will always be a reason for giving thanks to God, whether it's a general reason about creation and salvation or a specific reason relating to a season, be that Easter or Christmas or whatever we're celebrating. So in this case, it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word, through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin. Fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. Hopefully you can hear in those words a reason why we as a people, we as a church, we as a community, and we as individuals are giving thanks. Uh, through his beloved Son, he made all things. And then he sent him as our Savior and our Redeemer. He fulfilled God's will and gained for him a holy people. He stretched out his hands and endured the passion so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so for all those reasons, if you don't have something of your own in mind, all those reasons the church and her prayer gives us to join with the angels and the saints as we declare God's glory, holy, holy, holy. We move into, into the Sanctus, which comes from the uh, prophet Isaiah, where he has this vision of heaven, and there are angels singing, holy, holy, holy. We actually join with the angels in heaven and all creation and all God's people in praising God for what he's good. So the Eucharistic prayer, our great prayer of thanksgiving, is set up to give us a reason to be thankful from the very, very start of it. And then we go on with the prayer to give thanks in a way that is very Jewish, if you will. Um, so much of what we do in our Eucharistic prayer is really based in uh, what would have been Jewish dinner prayers that were often used, that Jesus then took and used in a very special way at the Last Supper. But the way that we say thank you in our Eucharistic prayer is Jewish in this sense. We don't just say, hey, thank you, God, for what you did. But we actually tell the story of what he did. And that is very powerful for the Jewish people. It's a powerful way to say thank you to someone by telling the story of what they have done for you. Um, for example, and you may have similar situations in your life, 
I can recall the story of my 20th anniversary mass just earlier this year here at St. Charles. And gratefully, my mother, even in her illness, was able to come and be with us. And the response of you, our community, to her presence was overwhelming. You made her feel so welcome. It made her feel like the star of the day, for which I'm very grateful. And whenever I tell that story about how uh, people in line greeted her as they moved her up through the line to get to, get to lunch, um, and everyone just thanking her and welcoming her and telling her, you can tell I'm getting a little choked up right now. Because in telling the story, that's so much more than just saying, hey, thank you, St. Charles, for what you did. It, it brings it alive. And, and for me, I can actually have an emotional reaction to it because I'm remembering what that was like and what that did for my mother. So in a sense, in telling that story, in remembering that story, it doesn't stay in the past for me. It doesn't stay something that happened on June 14 of the year 2015. It's something that I experience in a very real way right now. And that's the power of telling the story and remembering the story. And that's what our Eucharistic prayer, our Thanksgiving prayer, does for us. We tell the story. We remember what God did for us. And in so doing, we give thanks. And it leaves the story not in the past, but brings it forward to the present, makes it a reality of what God has done for us, not just 2,000 years ago on Calvary, but what he does right there in that moment in our church when we gather and celebrate Eucharist. We tell the story of how on the night before he died for us, he took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat of it. See how we're thanking God by telling the story of what he did for us? And then how in a similar way, he took the chalice full of wine and again gave God thanks and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and drink from it. We are remembering the story. We are keeping it alive. Um, we call for the mystery of faith which is nothing less than the Paschal mystery of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. We remember those things, and that keeps it alive. That's, I think, one way that we can say that the Eucharist truly is the present, the body and blood of Christ present for us, because in remembering, we keep it present. It doesn't remain in the past. It's why I think some people actually have an emotional, physical response to the presence of the Eucharist. They're aware of the power of the words that we've said a hundred thousand times and it moves them and touches them and they become aware of the reality of what happens there on the altar. I mean, really, we do exactly what Jesus did at the Last Supper. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and then gave it to the disciples. When the bread and wine is brought forward to the altar, we take it, we bless it, we give thanks for it, we break that bread and then we give it to one another. We ritually do exactly what Jesus did at the Last Supper. So even in our actions, we are remembering what Christ did for us, and remembering keeps it alive and present. Eventually, all that wonderful power that takes place there, all that work of the Spirit that is present uh, in the consecration and in our words and in our remembering and in our prayer, comes to a climax when we say, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. And then everyone present assents to that in the great Amen. We all say, yes, I believe, verily, there it is, that is true, Amen. I know that the Eucharistic prayer can seem long sometimes. On average, it runs about seven minutes, I think. How wonderful it would be if, if all of us, and I include myself, would be able to be more attentive to the words of that prayer that I offer on behalf of the entire community. If we could just recognize the power of what we're doing as we give thanks to God and we remember what he's done for us, thus making it present and real in our lives today and every day. So thank you again for joining us in our small groups today. Uh, next week, we'll look at the communion rite, and in our final week, we'll look at the blessing and dismissal. Um, enjoy your conversation. I look forward to seeing you at Mass on Sunday when we will give thanks to God because it is right and just.